dive into the, the, the music, I did want to share a little bit on David Baker, and I'm going to go ahead and do a quick screen share. I think that this New York Times obituary actually does a pretty good job of covering the basic bases of um, a truly exceptional person. I mean, I the more that I read about David Baker, the more that I just thought, like, this man was like a cat. He had like nine lives. Um, so, uh, you know, we can kind of go through this. Um, he passed somewhat recently in 2016. Um, and I think this is actually a really critical point to point out um, that so clearly extremely celebrated, extremely distinguished professor um, and scholar. But this paragraph right here, um, his laurels are all the more noteworthy in that he had been forced to reinvent his musical career three times. First, when he was barred from making his way as a classical trombonist because of his race. Second, when as a jazz man, he had to forsake the trombone after a devastating jaw injury. And third, when he was driven from a teaching job because he was married to a white woman. So, you know, just thinking about that kind of context. So um, to explain a little bit further as far as his biography. So he had originally been sort of training and on the track for being a classical musician, um, but, and, and he was also actually quite active as a teenager in the jazz scene in Indianapolis. Um, I love this quote. From the time I was able to draw a mustache on with an eyebrow pencil and pray it didn't rain, he haunted the city's thriving jazz clubs. So clearly uh, he was, you know, very much much during that era where to learn an instrument and to learn a, a, a practice was to do it in the kind of apprenticeship model of just showing up and learning and soaking it in and learning by osmosis. Um, and so, you know, he was on this track to be this symphony musician, um, but he, uh, he, uh, according to this quote, um, you know, at one point during an audition, you're probably the best one we've heard, but we can't employ you because of your color. So that was, you know, pivot number one. Um, and as he had already been in this practice as a jazz musician, he went on to have a quite a thriving professional career. Um, but this point is one of the more heartbreaking points of David Baker's story. So um, he was in an automobile accident. And I think, unfortunately, because of the kind of healthcare options that were available to people of color during that era, um, it wasn't properly treated. So the accident happened in 1953, but then in sometime in the 1960s, um, as a result of that accident that had been um, incorrectly diagnosed and incorrectly treated, there was a chronic facial tremor. So because of that, he had to give up his career as a very successful trombonist. I think the year that he was given that sort of death knell pronouncement of his career as a trombonist was the same year that he was um, uh, announced as like the uh, like a co-winner of Downbeat magazine's like number one new artist on the field or something. So like just as he was rising, that's just as he was told that no, that was no longer going to be an option for him. Um, and but then what is so fascinating and amazing to me is he then decided to he he switched to cello. <laughs> which I think is also beautiful because it's from trombone to cello. It's like, oh, it's the same clef. Might as well. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but he, and apparently he became skilled enough to actually be a performer. And then he also realized that since performing was in many ways behind him, that he really wanted to focus on um, pedagogy and composition. And so uh, most people, if you do a search on YouTube of David Baker, you'll have a lot more videos that are related to his practice as a jazz ed educator. Uh, I mean, he was really, really quite foundational in terms of what we all know to be jazz pedagogy. Um, if any of you out there have ever practiced to this Jamie Abersold books and tapes, Jamie Abersold was a student of David Baker's. And, you know, David Baker was really um, critical as far as how jazz music became codified. That's a word that appears quite a bit whenever people describe how he had an impact in terms of really being able to distill um, this oral music tradition into something that could be shared through textbooks through courses, through, um, you know, getting the recognition that it deserved in an academic setting like Indiana University. 
Um, so not only was he this tremendous pedagogue and also just an advocate for jazz education and jazz practice, but then he also was an incredibly prolific composer, uh, just this very rich output. Uh, we'll actually be sharing the links um, after this that you could see some of his catalog through uh, Lauren Kaiser Music as his publisher. And, um, and just a, a very uh, inventive composer uh, dabbled in all sorts of different um, genres, including string quartets like the one we're going to hear. Um, I love this one anecdote of one of his pieces, um, which I hope someday that the Dream Unfinished can perform. His concertino for cellular phones and orchestra, if that gives you any sort of indication of the kind of uh, just uh, imagination that this ma man had um, and apparently in the premiere it sounded like an aviary, aviary gone mad and I this is my favorite sentence ever the orchestra on stage was unfazed and the composer was delighted um, so to give you a little bit of a very different sort of taste of David Baker's music um, we did actually now want to shift over into the pastoral which was the piece that was performed um, following uh, Dr. King's assassination. Um, and so this is actually, and this was actually shocking to me too. So this is a pretty, I would say known piece. I, it, it's it's not as obscure as some of the other music that the Dream Unfinished has programmed. I've seen it in program notes and things like that, but there's actually only two recordings of it on YouTube um, and they're both quite recent. Um, so this is recorded as you can see in the timestamp here, um, it were released August of last year. And so we're only going to hear the first 90 seconds of it or so. This is the uh, uh, elegiac piece that was programmed um, in, in homage to Dr. King um, following the events of his passing. Such a beautiful work. Um, Sarah or Melanie, I'm curious if you have any reactions just to that little bit that we heard. It's so gorgeous. I mean, it, it's just so, uh, the, the depth of it, you know, every, everything is so connected. It's so, um, it's so beautiful and so specific to string instruments. Uh, the ease that you can play that piece, um, with which you can play that piece. And I, I think it's interesting, you had mentioned on that he switched from trombone to cello. And cellists, our joke with the trombonists is always that they're our brass cousins, um, you know, because uh, we're so similar in, in terms of range. And when he actually made that switch, uh, the professor at IU was Jana Starker, um, world-renowned cellist. Uh, and I mean, so the writing that came from that period of time, uh, you know, him working with Janos uh, to create some some really wonderful cello pieces and really wonderful recordings, um, just absolutely improved. I know that part of his repertoire, of his, uh, you know, composition, compositional repertoire. So it's it's just kind of amazing to see that correlation play out. Yeah. It's very lush. 
and it kind of uh, sets a different pace. It's very introspective and you're waiting for the, the chords to mesh and to change. And it's, it's deceptive because it starts out in traditional scalar format. And suddenly, so it's like an acknowledgement of the classical ambiance, and then it merges into very specific uh, vertical harmonies. That's really a, an interesting, interesting work uh, from a theoretical perspective. And then to think of its usage, it makes me really want to think about what that reception must have been like in that hall that day at noon and how that would have resonated with the, the feelings, the shock. I know in the part of the 1970 book that Delerma wrote on black music and our culture, he actually talks with several composers of African descent who then went, went, who went, then went on to write uh, pieces, uh, paying respects, paying tribute to Martin Luther King and talking about what the composers were thinking at that time. Yes, and Anthony McDonald's work is just a superior catalog of music written in honor of Martin Luther King. And for those of you interested in expanding your own horizons, now that you know Pastoral, this, this particular book, it's a reference book. So you'd, you'd see it at a library, but it's really easy to use because it gives you a sense of who wrote what about Martin Luther King when uh, kinds of information about it so you can help contextualize it. It's not just a, a standard list. It's really an integrated uh, volume that would be really helpful. Um, and personally, I, I certainly hope to see more works like that because, um, you know, David Baker's piece is, is really critical for that moment at Indiana University and what it symbolized for those in the scholarly community and the academic community and the university community. But Martin Luther King clearly has um, not just an effect on us uh, from a political standpoint, but look at the number of pieces that have been written musically, sonically to celebrate his life. That's, that's really something. And when you juxtapose that with things in historical musicology, I mean, who are the other people who have had that kind of tribute? Yeah. No, absolutely. And just bringing it back to Pastoral. So um, we definitely recommend that you go ahead and view the full clip um, from the Vickery chamber players. And we thank them for uh, performing uh, such a beautiful rendition of this and having it available for people to check out online. Um, and it should be noted that um, April Ayers, who's David Baker's daughter, she apparently um, left some I guess, program notes as far as the genesis of the piece and where it went on into growing in the description on that um, on that YouTube video. And I wanted to share a little bit here that, so Pastoral was actually a piece that he had written for her, um, but then uh, basically following that event, um, from that point, from, from the performance on April the 5th, um, that's when David Baker realized that he wanted to write a much larger homage. Um, and so Pastoral um, became um, a member of a larger multi-movement work called Black America, which is a cantata for jazz ensemble, narrators, uh, full chorus, soloist, and string orchestra. And um, he had this quote to share around Black America specifically. So... As a whole piece of art, I wanted everybody who listened to know that I was, first of all, angry at the senseless murder of Dr. King. Secondly, I wanted to register musically and with words in every way I knew that I was hurt. Still, I wanted everybody to know that a lot of love was there and that I didn't think this was the end of the world or that it was the end of relationships between black and white. All through, there was that element of hope that there must be a way somewhere. I refused to give up his dream though, and refuse to think there isn't a way because I know from my own experiences that there is a way. You know, and such beautiful words to think about, especially in context of where we are now. Um, and so just wanting to make sure that folks are aware that um, this music that we just heard um, and a lot of these books that we've been flashing and resources are all available. So in addition to um, 
some of the links that we've mentioned earlier, we're going to make sure, you know, Pastoral, you can get on Sheet Music Plus, <laughs> you can get on JW Pepper. It's actually quite accessible and easy to um, get in your hands if you would like to uh, program it and perform it as well. And as we mentioned, we'll also be linking to his, um, his catalog at Kaiser Southern Music so you could see the full range and scope of the output that this man had had. Um, yeah, but I think I'm going to uh, throw it to Sarah to close us out. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I mean, this was just a joy to be here and, and be among, uh, you know, the music nerds and, and really just kind of get into it uh, about Black classical music, um, especially at this, this important time in our history. And, um, you know, I know that this is something that we're going to be able to carry with us every day. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm just grateful to be here uh, for this conversation. And if you like conversations like these, please go ahead and click our like button. Please subscribe. We're going to have more in this YouTube series uh, that the Dream Unfinished is putting together. So um, it's going to be a rich and wonderful conversation, just as it has been today. Uh, so thank you, everyone, again, and we will hope to see you next time.